brought to you almost live from the dude in the basement studios. Why? Because that's where the good stuff is. It sips, suds, and smokes with your smoke and host, the good old boys. Suds, suds, suds. It's time for more suds. Hello and welcome to another suds segment. I am one of your hosts today, good old boy Mike, and I have a whole crowd here joining me today for this suds segment. Here at the table, I have good old gal Juliana. Hi, everyone. And good old boy Dave. Hello. Reverend Mark. Good afternoon, friends. And good old boy John. Hello. It is so cool to have all the gang back together for this great segment. And this is a brewery takeover segment for Weyerbacher. And we'll do a a full overview about uh, Weyerbacher as well. Listen, if you haven't listened to our Sud segments before, they're all, it's pretty easy. It's all about beer, beer, and more beer, and then more beer, and more beer even after that. So uh, today's beers are all from Weyerbacher Brewery. And uh, we will go through. uh, a few of these today, not all of them, but here are the beers that we have from Weyerbacher. Blasphemy, Verboten, Insanity, Blithering Idiot, Old Heathen, Quad, Heresy, Last Chance IPA, Double Simcoe, and the Reserva Raspberry uh, is, are the beers that we're going through today. And I love the fact that when we're going through these names that Reverend Mark has actually restored an entire sermon out of these names, but we... For some reason, we were never saved and then moved into all the sin. You started right off with yes, blasphemy. Blasphemy. <laughs> and then heresy. <laughs> and then insanity. And you become a blithering idiot that then gets uh, put into the reserve. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad that we have a holy man here at the table to help us through all of these beers. Because... Uh, we uh, definitely have enjoyed tasting all these. All right, John, you're going to tell us all about uh, what we're going to be uh, doing as we uh, talk about these beers. Absolutely. We'll be uh, tasting and discussing all the beers, uh, as well as rating them using the uh, Sip, Suds, and Smokes beer rating system, plus our signature belch sounds. Uh, here are those ratings now. Uh, a rating of one is, that sucks. Give me a, Give me anything but a bud. A two, which is, was that a belch? A three, ah, what a relief. Four, which is, a body should really not make that sound. I think I made a lot of those sounds while we were (laughs) tasting. And, of course, five, listen to the hang time, give me another. Excellent. Thank you, John, for that overview. And uh, so uh, our uh, Weyerbacher is actually from Philadelphia, and that is your place, isn't it, Julian? That it is. I mean, every time we talk about Philadelphia, you swoon over every Philly beer that we've ever mentioned on this show. Yep. (laughs) Yep. I can't deny it. I am a northeastern Pennsylvania girl, therefore i got to represent my peeps. Well, uh, today is uh, the day for brewery takeover from Philly. Uh, So, um, what do you think about when someone mentions a Weyerbacher beer? Um, German. A blithering idiot. Exactly. (laughs) Which is usually me after a few of them. But anyways... Um, German big full flavored beers. Mm. That's a Weyerbacher to me. Mm. Not to be confused with uh, the wood making company, mm. Weyerbacher. Oh, definitely not. That's Weyerhaeuser. Oh, I, yeah. I think, See, yeah. it's yeah. close enough that it's confusing. After you have a bunch of blithering yeah. idiots, it all there runs together anyway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, I definitely do every time we are coming up with a show, I look for sounds that are complementary to, you know, what we should be, you know, playing um, or what would sound like that beer. So uh, every time I hear the the mention of the word Philly, all I start hearing are sounds from Rocky, you know, and I think of running up the steps, you know, <laughs> the library. I mean, it's the only place I know where the city is so 
has embraced the culture of Rocky, you know, so much that they've actually erected a statue of Rocky on the top of the steps <laughs> yep. of the library. So, anyway. But, uh, Juliana, uh, what are the sounds of Philly that you think about when I mention the word Philly? Well, and first Those of, are my sounds. What are yours? Well, and first of all, sadly, Rocky has now moved off the top of the steps. Really? He's now yeah. at the base in the corner. But have no fear, because your local panhandler will be happy to take your photo of Rocky. <laughs> and possibly Just take ask your, Dave. Possibly take your camera when you're... Afterwards. Uh, yeah. yeah. Just to preserve that memory. So anyways, um, what do I think of when I think of Philly? First of all, speaking of Rocky, intensely... Intense fans at a Flyers game that are that is like almost to the point of being a riot. They are the loudest, the most obnoxiously crazy fans. I think they're a dead tie with Detroit. Uh, they're worse than Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> they are, but you know, but that's what makes Philly Philly. Philly is a very aggressive city. Um, another sound from Philly is the intense traffic. And the beeping, and the beeping of the traffic, it's and the traffic congestion. I, it's awful. I, yeah, I, I think there are two cities that just were never constructed for uh, automobile traffic. Boston is absolutely at the top of my list. That city was not created for one automobile to drive through it, and I would say Philly is a is a, a very close second uh, for me. And you know, you're right. I, it seems like I spend more time, you know, sitting in traffic than I would ever care to admit in uh, Philly. Well, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, definitely most of life is always better with a soundtrack, as usual. And when I think of my sound of Philly, it's definitely John Coltrane. So, without further ado, let's bring on John Coltrane as we talk about Wirebucker. So, for the German novices out there, Weierbacher is phonetically pronounced Weierbacher, as simple as it sounds. Um, it was a company that was founded in 1995 by Dan and Sue Weierbach. Rumor has it that um, Dan was a home brewer himself, and the couple were on a vacation up north, I believe in Vermont or Maine, and they happened to run across this small local brewery. And um, it was a small space. I think it was either in the basement of a building or a barn. But anyways, they were so entranced by it, and Dan was looking for a new job anyways, that he said to his wife, hey, why don't we start a brewery? Brewer unemployed. <laughs> is that the path to becoming a brewer? <laughs> John is saying might well, yes. Might as well start somewhere, right? Yeah. If you don't have anything, you start somewhere. So... Um, they ran a small operation and a brew pub until the lightning hit in 1997, and they produced their first big beer, the Raspberry Imperial Stout. Oh. <laughs> now, the reason why I say that is because, for me, growing up in the Northeast, there were only two types of beer that were readily available. That being Guinness, because I lived in a very predominant Irish community, and then Rolling Rock, because it was my, it was my poor man's beer um, that everyone could get their hands on, because Stegmeier had already closed shop for a while. Mm. So, you really didn't have a good variety when it came to flavors of beer. You just had, you know, cheap Rolling Rock, no offense, and then you had a good Guinness Stout, which was always available on tap. Yum. However, um... I heard when I heard that the Imperial Stout was coming out, and that w then then it had raspberries in it. I was thinking this has got to be the craziest thing anyone ever thought of. Now this was, you know, in Pennsylvania we're very plain with our flavors, so um, I tried it and I immediately fell in love. And then I'm like, okay, there's got to be more coming, right? There's got to be more coming, and of course there was. Um, they followed that year by brewing the Blithering Idiot Barley Wine and then began throwing in Belgian beers as well, like our Mary's Monk Ale, which is their Belgian-style triple. Um, this defined the brewery style and the mantra. It was, let's make full-flavored, high-quality brews for a discerning customer. And initially, that discerning customer was hidden, but he came out with a vengeance and told his friends. <laughs> And now that's why Weyerbacher is one of the 
one of the biggest breweries in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, very proud to say that. They are now distributing in 18 states. Yay! Their current production facility is the former brewery for Victory, which Victory themselves have upgraded recently. They took over production in the current brew house in 2005 with a capacity of a 25-barrel brew house. Now, I love what you added to this was that one of the things that makes Weyerbacher unique is uh, that they were a pioneer in barrel aging. Yes, they were. So, I, I know this is hard for a lot of people who are craft brew lovers to realize, but barrel aging beers has not been around forever as much as we would like to think of it. And when the Imperial Stout came out, um, there was talk of them, you know, doing barrel-aged beers. And I had no idea what that was at the time. And I thought, well, why would you want to ruin a barrel? All you're going to get is wood, wood, wood. But not realizing that you're getting these amazing flavors with it. So that's why in the Weyerbacher catalog, you have what I'm calling the virgin styles, like the quads, and then you're going to have the upgraded styles, um, which are oak-aged. Um, and that's what, to me, allows you to have the same beer brewed the same way, but with two different, but with an added benefit. So you can learn um, what the difference is between an unbarrel-aged and a barrel-aged. Mm. And I like that uh, discussion because uh, we actually had several beers that fall directly in both those categories through, even through these nine beers, and that was just by accident. I mean, I was just happened to pick up, you know, beers that I had or that were available, um, you know, for us to go through. And I happened to pick up some that were non-oaked and some that were oaked or aged um, that, you know, help us. Uh, understand, you know, the unique characteristics that that can actually bring, you know, to the beer. And, you know, I think that I have a, a an old adage, which is I'm not a fan of aging beers, I, you know, in general. Uh, my favorite beers are fresh beers. Um, but I think that I have definitely come around and seeing that there are several styles of beers that I think lend themselves, you know, much better to aging. And I actually like them better, you know, aged. And a couple of them uh, we've had... Um, on some other shows, um, there are a couple here with Weyerbacher that I th- think I probably like the aged version better than I do the non-aged version as well. So this is a re- really great, uh, it's a great experiment and, I, and a, a great showdown for us to talk about today. In fact, we can almost say that not only is this a brewery takeover, but we have as, as much discussion about aging or non-aging because we have some really solid examples here uh, across a couple of these beers today. All right, so there are like 75 beers from Weyerbacher. I mean, it, it, when I was looking at all of the beers that they produce, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And I don't know if that's basically you're just seeing, again, the same thing, the aged, non-aged versions. So only maybe they only have like 40 beers, but they, you know, basically split things across. Although I don't know, they don't do that with every single style. There's just no way. But they definitely make a very wide variety of beers, and there's just no way we would cover them all, you know, on this show. So... Um, in fact, one of their better beers, which you mentioned, was the Mary Monk Ale. Uh, actually, we, were, we are not reviewing today, so it's unfortunate that we do not have that particular product. Somebody from Weyerbacher, feel free to send it. Subsist and smoke at Please, gmail.com. I live in East Nashville. You can come visit me anytime. <laughs> Just yes. saying. We're in, a, we're in a Weyerbacher desert, you know, here in Nashville. So uh, that'd be great uh, to definitely uh, see some more products and come back around. And this is one of the free breweries. I think it would be great to have a, a another brewery takeover you know discussion about so we can actually see mm-hmm. some of the rest of the beers um that are being produced well today uh, we uh, today we have nine i'm sorry 10 of these beers to discuss and our format uh that we're going to go through the discussion is we actually sat down we've tasted all these beers we've come up with what we consider our top five um using our our rating style and we'll go around those top five um through our discussion And then we'll uh, talk about the balance of the beers um, that maybe not hit everybody's uh, top five. And uh, so that's what we're going to go through here for Weyerbacher. All right. So first up, uh, our uh, number one pick out of the nine beers that we went through is, uh, no surprise, is actually going to be the uh, (coughs) Reserva Raspberry Tart. (coughs) Um, And... 
what a shock for this crew to pick a sour beer <laughs> out, of, <laughs> out of these ten yeah. to say it's my number one pick. Completely unprecedented. Yeah, course. I know. How about that? So um, let's go around the room and uh, talk about our tasting notes uh, for this. Juliana, I'll let you go first here. Love, love, love. Okay. Um, I had to say that about this. But what I like is, first of all, for Weyerbacher being a, a traditional, you know, big fat full flavors of um, a Belgian style beers, for them to do something like this, I totally applaud them because this is completely different than anything else that we tried today. That being said, um, I love the the tartness of the raspberries I, and you could taste that sour puckerness of um, of the bretomyces and to me it's a good balance because it's not overly tart it's not overly acidic um, and I really like that it that the base of this beer was an amber ale um, mm. you know well, and I just caught myself. We, you know, we haven't shared with the audience what this is actually. Oh. We just said what the name of it was. Um, so, Reserva is a. It is a sour beer. Um, it is a raspberry puree that is aged in oak. The ABV of this is eleven point four percent. And I, so, you were going through and saying that this is a bread, and it is. We talked about this earlier, which is it is a bread that's added. Mm-hmm. Um. And then, of course, it's aged in the oak. So, to me, it's a good balance between the sourness of the bread, um, the fruitiness of the raspberry, and the oakiness that comes along with it. So, I really enjoy this, and I'm giving this a five. Wow. I'm shocked. <laughs> As you should be, sir. I'm sorry. Who brought you this beer? <laughs> I, you know, this was really great. I actually ran across this beer and um, uh, when I was in North Carolina, and uh, it was just sitting right there on the shelf, and it had a nice bow on it. It said, for Juliana. <laughs> um, and I just, I, I, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, hmm, gee, wow, I know exactly where that beer is going. So thank you, uh, f- you know, for sharing that, you know, with us today. Dave, what do you think of uh, Reserva? Well, I loved it. Um I kind of had a different take on it from what Juliana was saying. I think it's fairly aggressive in the tartness and the sourness. Mm. Um, there's a, an extremely dry finish at the end that um, if you're not a sour beer um, lover, I don't think this would be a good beer for you. But if you do like sour beers, this is a beer that if you can find it, you should definitely try it. Mm. Um, the the base body style of it gives it a nice mouth feel, um, gives it good coloring. It's uh, it's good to look at, it's good to smell, and it's definitely good to drink. Mm. Um, so what's your suds rating on this? I'm going to give it a five. A five as well. There you have it. Next up, Reverend Mark, what do you think of Reserva Raspberry here? I'm in between these last two assessments in that I believe it, it does come come forward with a lot of tartness uh, but not overwhelming I was talking with John just a minute ago ago before we came in here and it seemed as though we both really picked up on a lot of kind of lactic uh, thinking that it was almost uh, um, a uh, well of course is that a good thing or a bad thing I don't know Uh, lactic is good if what it provides is that pucker Mm -hmm. that you get from a lot of um, sour beers. It's that lactic acid, um, lactobacillus being the bacteria, and pediococcus as well will do the same. Uh, it'll give you that pucker that, that complements really well in this beer because of the, the raspberry tartness kind of complements that pucker mm-hmm. factor. And that's why I was so surprised to find out that this was a... Uh, a a bread. Well, no one uh, that the base beer was uh, amber. And amber, yeah, mm. yeah. It just didn't really strike me as that. Of course, you couldn't really tell by the kind of the the analysis of the color because of the res- raspberry. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought it was more of a kind of a wheat based, uh, very kind of a dry Berliner Weiss kind of beer. Uh, maybe a, a big, big, big Berliner Weiss. Yeah, I know when we were chatting, that's exactly what John uh, said, and I, I totally thought that was right on yeah. the head. You know, when you said that. And I'm I'm not really 
big on fruit beers. I uh, I like to craft a few every year just to kind of compete with them and for holidays and all that. But personally, I don't really care for fruit beer that much. Uh, but this is one that I could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a little fast hit. That. <laughs> but typically, I use raspberry um, if I'm going to do anything on all because it, it it tends to have a longer shelf life if you will certainly with a bigger beer if you want to age something you know it uh, it, it tends to, to to hold up um so i you know i i thought that um uh, you know the the fruit the tart the sour uh, kind of the la- little lactic aspect in there it was all pretty well balanced um i enjoyed it a lot i gave it my the top rating of all the beers that i tried today hmm. which yeah. was five five as well wow it's tough going around here John, what do you think of the Reserva? Uh, it's not going to be much different than anybody else. Uh, it was it was by far the best beer that I had today. Um, I do tend to lean towards the sour beers when it comes to um, my personal preference. And yet he skipped the show, the sour beer show. <laughs> yeah. So you're making up for it now. That's a scheduling conflict. Uh, yeah, Mike. I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the the um, the reason I like this. One of my favorite beers of all time is is the Nuglaris Raspberry Tart, and we talked about it earlier uh, before the show that for me this beer is slightly more acidic, slightly more tart than the Raspberry Tart would be. So I don't think it's not a beer you would want to give somebody who who is just entering the sour market. I think it's fine. I don't think it's overly lactic. Um, you, what you don't want to give somebody is a goose to start off with. You know, that's that's it's really... It's goose Yes. <laughs> You're supposed to say goose goose <laughs> yeah. That's very, very tart. Um, this one is, is slightly tart. I don't, I don't think it's much more tart than a raspberry would be in general. Um, but I think in this beer, you can taste the difference between that raspberry tartness mm-hmm. and the tartness that the lactic acid and the, the, the sour beer character has. Um and it's very very drinkable. You got to be careful because it is an eleven percent yep. tart sour beer, um, kinda, but you don't really get uh, a lot of them. You don't you don't find very many really high alcohol sour beers out say. there. And, and yeah. mm. uh, this one was much much higher than I expected to be. And you you can't tell when you're drinking it that it's a, an eleven percent beer, so it could very easily sneak up on you. Mm-hmm. So what's your sed rating on this? It, it's a five. Mm. A five as well. Well, there you have it. Uh, Oh, you guys definitely have wrecked the house on that. So um, my tasting notes are at the very top. Are, where was this on the Sour Beer Show? <laughs> <laughs> Juliana. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, uh, this would have fit uh, really uh, right in. And, uh, you know, I thought it was very good. Um, I uh, liked, um, I identified with Dave's comments um, and I was, as he was saying it, I was thinking that a lot of the tasting characteristics of a crisp Sauvignon Blanc, um, that very crisp element, you know, um, where it just kind of fleets off your palate really quick and dry characteristics. I like that. I didn't write that down, but when you said that, I went, hmm, yep, you, that's totally it. You yeah. can use that. That's fine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Copyright, good old boy Dave. <laughs> tasting notes on reserve. Uh, so. Um, I thought it was a little thin, uh, you know, um, Mm -hmm. on the palate as well. And I think maybe I can see where you would describe something as dry and saying it was a little thin because it just kind of went off your palate really quick. So, um, and a really high compliment uh, to you, good old boy, John, which is, um, so we tasted the new Glarus uh, raspberry Mm -hmm. tart um, on another show, and I did not think this was good as the new Glarus. Um, very different, in fact. Yeah. Um, I don't even know that they were from the sta- uh, same strain of uh, sour uh, of uh, you know products, but yeah, uh, definitely to me they're different sour beers. Yeah, yeah. Well, other than uh, just having a common characteristic that they're both raspberries, yeah. I don't know that I would really say they're exactly the same. You know, beers. But when I think of a raspberry beer, you know, I think well, that's the tarting. You know, the fruit characteristic. And I would definitely come back to the new Glarus, you know, if both of them were sitting there on the table. But I still thought this was a good beer. I thought it was very well balanced. Um, I love the sweet, tart, um, raspberry kind of balance of it all. Um, so my rating for the Reserva Raspberry Puree is a three. Ah, what a relief. All right, so we're out of the shoot with our first uh, beer here for Weinbacher. Number two is going to be Heresy. Uh, Heresy is, one second as I move to our notes for that, is an imperial stout. 
Um, this is uh, ABV of 8.2%. Um, some of the uh, description from Weinbacher about what this is, it is uh, basically they take the Old Heathen, which was in our lineup here. So this is one of the examples where we had an aged and a non-aged version. Um, they take the Old Heathen Imperial Stout in oak barrels um, that are used for uh, Kentucky bourbon. Um, so that definitely explains a lot of my tasting notes uh, rather quickly around this. So the result is an extraordinary dark, mysterious stout whose very essence has been enhanced, blah, 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 by vanilla, cocoa, and roasted coffee beans. So um, Heresy is actually released in February, so I'm guessing that upstream of that is Old Heathen is probably a, you know six months ahead of that. Yeah. I don't know how long they age it. It's not here in the notes, but... My guess is, you know, it's probably somewhere around 90 days. Yeah. Uh, it's probably a good average, um, you know, definitely in bourbon barrels. So uh, that's no review about this particular beer. We've rated it as number two. Juliana, what are your tasting notes around Heresy here? Well, Heresy is one that I go back to time and time again every time I go home. Um, what I love about it is that, you know, on its own, Old Heathen is a good beer, but this it lingers on the tongue it's very smooth to me and i get a really good bourbon flavor out of it um which makes me enjoy the stout even more so it's very um it's very flavorful but the the whiskey in it is what draws me into it even more hmm. So um, for this, I'm going to give this a four. A four? Wow, how about that? Good old boy Dave, what do you think of Heresy? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with Juliana. I think um, Old Heathen is a good stout, but Heresy takes it to another level. Um, uh, the mouthfeel on this beer is exactly what I want out of a big stout. It's very smooth and silky. Nice vanilla from the oak aging. I'm going to give it. Uh, I give it a four as well. Wow. Uh, mm. uh, uh. Reverend Mark, what do you think of Weyerbacher Heresy here? Well, I have to say, as I was, uh, I wasn't wearing my glasses when I was first, you know, looking at the description here, and I went and picked up the bottle and poured myself a glass. And uh, of course, knowing that Weyerbacher is from Pennsylvania, I, is that a semi I thought, it, I thought, I thought it was. <laughs> Hershey, and I went. Oh yeah, yeah. I get, I get that. I get that. So I actually wrote that down, but it does say there's cocoa in here. It's like an old Hershey bar. What did you think of yeah. Weyerbacher Heresy? Uh, I like. I like the barrel uh, aging outcome on this particular one as compared to uh, the uh, the old heathen. It's interesting that the uh, the alcohol the ABV slightly ticks up when you barrel age. I guess it mm. you, it just a little bit. Well, it continues fermenting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, then you get kind of that uh, angel share when it's sitting in the barrel. Some that's going right. to exactly. evaporate off in the yeah in the wood. And the oak absorbs some of the, yeah, the water ex- out of it. Too. Yeah, that's exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, that's that's just another aspect of barrel aging that I think with a big beer, you know, it um, gives you a little bit more um, intensity of flavor just of the base beer itself. Uh, and I and I feel as though there was a you know a host of really assertive big flavors here that were you know uh, uh, kind of in balance with each other pretty well. Um, so no, I I definitely I'd give it a four. Mm. How about that? Good old boy John, what do you think of uh, Weyerbacher Heresy? I'm right in line with Mark here. Uh, I honestly didn't really care too much for the old heathen. I, I gave it a fairly low rating. Hmm. Um, but the Heresy, all of a sudden, the, the things that I didn't like about old heathen were mellowed out and smoothed out by the oak and the bourbon character. It kind of just, you know, for old heathen, I had kind of ashy bitterness and kind of that acrid harshness that that you get with some imperial stouts and and when you barrel aged and all of a sudden those oak smoothness and the vanilla and the, the that oak character just mellowed all of that out or blended it together much more smoothly and and i thought it was much much better as a as a barrel aged beer um i gave it a I'm in between. Okay, I'm, I'm, I was in, I put three and four. I'm going to lean towards three because I don't think it was a four for me. Hmm. There you have it. Ah, oh, what a relief! All right, so uh, 
You know, as as soon as uh, uh, we started talking about this, I actually went back and I was looking at my old heathen, you know, rating, um, and it definitely went right where you went, John. Which was now that I understand the relationship between these, you know, kind of what is what did I think about one, you know, aged and non aged, and oddly enough, I rated them exactly the same, <laughs> um, although my tasting notes were not even close to. Um, so. Um, you know, I wrote that uh, this is um, this is the better of the two imperial stouts. So I think that that is reflecting. I probably enjoy the aged version better, even though I rated them both exactly the same. Um, it's still too sweet for me. Um, I, you know, when I think of what makes it for an imperial stout for me, it's. It's definitely you're having a lot of depth and layers of flavor, you know, that are there. And when I looked at all of the the various, you know, tasting components that were offered up in the, you know, commercial description of it, I didn't see but like one of these. So I just really thought it was um, a bit too one dimensional for me for an imperial, and definitely the fact that it was still too sweet for me. It just. Uh, It wasn't kind of bringing it home for me as an Imperial Stout. Even with that said, um, my rating for this is a four. Uh, 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 But I should really not make that sound. So there you have our uh, number two pick here in the lineup uh, for Weyerbacher beers. Number three is going to be Blithering Idiot. (coughs) And Blithering Idiot is a... Get there really quickly. It's a barley wine. (laughs) Um... This is uh, has an ABV of eleven point one percent, and this is uh, considered actually a European style um, barley wine. And if you don't know what that means, listen to our barley wine show. You'll understand one of the various styles of barley wines, um, as well as we probably are going through. I don't know about fifteen different barley wines in the barley wine show. So, <laughs> um, so I don't know if it was just the fact that um, that was. Uh, I, I thought it was an interesting choice for a style of a barley wine anyway. Um, some other uh, ways that they describe the beer from Weyerbacher is uh, notes of date and perhaps fig on the palate follow a pleasurable malty aroma to taste buds. <laughs> Boy, I wish I had been in some of these marketing meetings where they come up with this. This should be in our tasting room as we're writing down. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's not what I think of this beer. But anyway, it's just some, sometimes the uh, marketing makeup here of this is interesting. So uh, let's go around the table here again. Juliana, what do you think of Weyerbacher Blithering Idiot? Well, of note, we were lucky enough to have two versions of this barley wine. Um, we had both the Blithering Idiot and the Insanity, which um, is their barrel-aged version of the barley wine. Mm. And... You know, I'm all about whiskey, I'm all about scotch, and anything that's barrel-aged. Usually I'm like, yeah, this is better, better. But in this case, I really like the Blithering Idiot better than the Insanity. Because to me, a barley wine needs to be fruity. It needs to be malty. And I think that aging it takes away from that flavor. So for me, um, I'm tasting... A good amount of malts. I'm tasting figs and I'm tasting raisins and I, I'm tasting all that makes a barley wine great to me. Mm. Um, so for this, I'm giving it a four. A four. Uh, uh, Body should really not make this sound. Good old boy Dave, what do you think of Weyerbacher's Blithering in it? Well, um, you know, this is an English style barley wine. Um, and for me personally, when there are. Mr. English Ale. That's right, Mr. English Ale. Speaking, um, when there's a choice between American style and an English style of any beer, IPAs, um, uh, pails, or barley wines, things like that, I usually defer to the English style. I like the malty flavors. Um, this is malty goodness. Um, it's sweet, but not cloying. And it balances out. There's a nice burnt sugar. I think when they say dates um, and figs, I what I get from that is sort of a caramelized burnt sugar taste right at the end that smooths it out. Hmm. I gave this a five. Wow. I think you liked it. <laughs> Reverend Mark, what do you think of Weibacher's Blithering Idiot? Well, before I tell you my score, I'd like to say that I, I, I generally agree with the comments that are being made about you know, how you, um, you know, really assess beer uh, as true to style and if, if, if it is sort of 
proffered as a an English barley wine, then it really should just come across in a very simple. Uh, to me, it's a very simple uh, and yet big big beer. Um, I think that we're also dealing in the craft beer sort of boom right now uh, the uh, American imperialization of almost everything and that's sometimes it's very interesting and very good but sometimes it's a little uh, wearisome so uh, having said that I really didn't like it as much as uh, as the insanity Uh, you know (laughs) that's cool (laughs) I, did, uh, I, I liked it, but I felt as though the uh, the barrel aging worked for the insanity as well. Um, and I and I and, and I kind of had to also imagine where you know, in a sort of optimum sort of sense, would I want to be consuming this particular beer? And it would be like a ski slope or you know, some winter night, and it'd be opening up you know slowly in a big snifter. And I thought the insanity, well, either would be fine, but I thought the insanity kind of had a few extra layers that uh, I would like to kind of sit around with for a long period of time. Uh, but that said, I think this is very true to style to an English barley wine, so I'm not going to really ding it, uh, but I will give it a three. How about that? <laughs> Good old boy, John, what would you think of Blithering Idiot here? I, it, first of all, I'd like to say it was a good beer, and... I just I, to, for me, it, it, the description says uh, it's on the malty side without being overly sweet. To me, it was overly sweet, and mm. I don't know if it's because it is a fairly young version. The older they get, the alcohol tends to kind of fade out a little more, and it becomes less warming, and the alcohol sweetness kind of goes away. And I think maybe that's what I was getting because I, I get the alcohol. It's really smooth for an eleven percent beer. I was I was really surprised that it was as I expect barley wines to be kind of hot if they're not old, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this one wasn't particularly hot. But yeah, you could, for high alcohol beer, I agree. Yeah, usually the older they are, the more smooth that alcohol gets. And this is, I mean, I assume it's a very young beer, so, um, but it was very smooth. It wasn't my favorite. I, I, to be quite honest, I didn't care for the uh, the, the barrel aged version either. I gave it a slightly lower rating, but mm. um, for this, I gave it a three. Oh, three. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what a relief. All right, so my tasting notes here on Weyerbacher, Blithering Idiot. Um, I thought between the two uh, barley wines we had, I thought this was the better uh, barley wine. Um, I thought it was well-balanced. Um, and I liked some of what uh, how Juliana was describing some of the things that she liked about barley wines and that they needed to have some element of being crisp as well as um fruity characteristics that are brought and i would consider them like uh, you know very rich you know ripe fruits not like tarty kind of fruits you know things that have feel like they've they've been you know fully reached you know maturity in terms of fruit characteristic um i do tend to i I like barrel aged um barley wines uh in general i think they lend themselves very well and create a lot of interesting you know flavor profiles about them but actually between the two here i really like the non-barrel age version here with weyerbacher so i thought that was a interesting point of epiphany uh as well i was picking up on uh, the same uh, some of the same things that john was saying and i wrote down it had a light cream ale finish and it took me a little while to figure out i'm like i've tasted this before where have i had it before <laughs> and um uh it, it definitely uh it was sweeter than I probably would have enjoyed, um, you know, on the finish itself. So, with that, my sedge rating for this is going to be a four as well. But I should really not make that sound. All right, so uh, there you have it for our number three pick. Number four uh, pick is going to be the quad. And let me move over and tell you all about the quad here. Like. I really needed these notes to tell me what is a Belgian quad. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so this is uh, Weyerbacher's uh, Belgian quad. Um, this is uh, has an ABV of 11.9%. Um, and I think that they were definitely swinging from the fences here. And definitely when you read through um, everything that they were describing the beer as a elegant and dark ale, rich with complexity and flavor, um, it's everything that you generally are looking for in a Belgian quad is the way they describe it. So, you know, 
Uh, there are a lot of Belgian quads out there as uh, reference beers, and I would say that their description of what they were going for here is probably no different than a lot of the other Belgian quads that are available on the market. With that said, Juliana, what did you think of Weyerbacher's quad here? Well, interesting for this. I mean, it is, I, to me, it is rather true to style, and you're getting that um, candy sugar taste that you would expect out of it. You're getting some of your ripe fruits out of it but um as much as i enjoyed it i really like the blasphemy even better hmm. so and blasphemy is the barrel aged version, version of, this. of this so for as great to me as um as the quad is i love the other one even more um so that being said i'm going to rate this one a three hmm. a three i would a relief good old boy dave what do you think of the quad here from Weyerbacher? Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was very true to style. I got uh, some banana in the uh, in the aroma and everything. And I usually don't always like everybody says. Well, I smell banana and clove and all that stuff. I don't always get that, but I actually got it in this one. So I thought that was pretty cool. Maybe I'm growing as a person. I don't know. <laughs> For me, it's about what I hear in my head when yeah, I'm having a Belgian what the clock. voices are telling. You know, me. I should have yeah. cuckoo clocks playing in yeah. the background, you know, or something like that. But um, I. Uh, I thought the flavor was good. I thought it was very balanced. Um, when I drink a quad, I think this is what I would think of when I think of a quad. So mm. I gave it a four. Wow. A, I'm sorry. There we go. <coughs> Reverend Mark, what do you think of the Belgian quad here from Weyerbacher? Well, it would seem that Juliana is sort of uh, telepathically giving me my notes here. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> like you. agreeing with her on everything today, it seems. Um I, too, feel as though uh, this was not quite at the same level as the blasphemy. Um, and so, for me, it was it was true to style. I don't... I didn't really get that it was um, as as big a beer as it, as it says it is on the uh, uh, on the ratings here of a, being a, almost a 12%. It didn't it didn't strike me as really a big, uh, you know, uh, warming kind of beer. Um, I did get a few fruit notes to it as well, um, but I think again, all these beers that we sampled today, if I went back out there and they warmed up and opened up a little bit more, I think you know I could probably write myself a few more notes. Uh, but this was still very fine, true to style, and I'll give it a three. Mm, a three. Oh, we're a relief. <clears throat> Good old boy, John. What do you think of this quad air? I'm again. I think me and Mark are. I'm actually opposite of Juliana and Mark in this particular one. And I, I, I gave Blasphemy a very similar rating, but the notes on it were kind of worse than the ones I had for the basic quad. It, I liked the way the quad tasted. It was a quad, as you would expect a quad to be. They're very simple beers. They're basically single malt beers with a lot of candy sugar added for all the extra alcohol. And the, a lot of the character comes from that. That really dark. You know, caramel sugar that they add. So, um, but to me, this was very simple, a very good beer. Um, to me, the bourbon barrel just distracted from the quad character of the beer. That the things I liked in the quad, I didn't like in the in the barrel aged version. Mm-hmm. So, uh, this beer I gave a four. Wow. Uh, okay. uh, All that, and I thought I was going to pan it. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, I am a uh, I'm a recovering uh, Belgian addict, and uh, you know, coming around. First step is admitting it. I know. Yes, I just need to blend the raspberry and the quad together. I'm sure I'll <laughs> arrive at some point of great equilibrium. Um, but I, I really do. I love uh, quads uh, in general, and I definitely have you know a very short list of beers you know I think of in this style uh, rather quickly. Um, you know, I uh, for this particular quad, I actually like this better than the Blasphemy, which was the Oak Age version. Um, it was still just way too sweet for me. Um, and, you know, some of you were standing around me as I was tasting these, and I'm like, they're starting to all kind of run together. And it seemed like I wrote that down with a lot of the beers. It's mm-hmm. still sweet, still sweet, still sweet. I thought my palate was busted or something. I was, went over and, you know, I had a, a bite of something to eat going, okay, I don't know, maybe I'm just off kilter or something today. <laughs> um, but 
actually, I, as I, I went back to it, um, it really kind of confirmed that I really this is um, definitely the balance was was kind of way off, you know, from my perspective about this particular Belgian quad. I really panned the blast me. I won't tell you what I rated it at, but that would probably not be, you know, a quad that I would go back to. So um, sorry about that, uh, Weibacher. But with that uh, said, my Sedge rating for Weibacher quad is actually going to be three. All right, so there you have our top four so far. Next up, number five is going to be uh, the Double Simcoe. Yep. So um, we're going to do this one a little bit different <laughs> because um, um, this is uh, uh, it's really great that uh, w- this is a beer actually we've rated on another show and we've it's probably been I don't know a good six months since we had that double Simcoe um, so um, it'll be interesting go back and I know I'm going to do you guys will probably do this you'll go back and you'll listen to that show and go what did I say about it the first time because <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting to see exactly what uh, you would describe for this so uh, this beer the Double Simcoe is an Imperial Double IPA uh, it is made with all Simcoe hops um, this was created uh, in 2000 with uh, hops from select botanicals um, and Simcoe uh, if you don't know what kind of the flavor profile it's kind of a citrusy grapefruit piney you know there's feels like something is stuck in your nose kind of a resin you know uh, in there that's kind of what it smells like if we just smell straight up you know Simcoe um, I think the word is dank dank uh, is it- <laughs> Dank, dank is pretty much. Uh, you get kind of a citrusy dank character. Yeah, but what does but dank I, smell like, Dave? It smells like Simcoe. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the first step to recovery. <laughs> All right, so it uh, smells like John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, Juliana, what did you think of Double Simcoe this time around? I love it. Um, And maybe it's because, you know, we've had so many big, heavy-flavored beers. Um, I love, love, love this. But then again, I'm not the kind of girl that wants to go with that, like, crazy citrus bomb that everyone's into. I like having a piney, resinous kind of hop flavor, and I get a lot of that. I get this, it's like a very earthy IPA. And for it being a double IPA, meaning that it's, like, ranked up in the ABV, I don't really feel that. Um, I just feel a good, clean flavor and a a good piney taste, and I I really am enjoying this beer. And I'm enjoying it even as it's warming up. Um, So I'm giving this a four. Wow, a four. So, Dave, do you remember how you rated this last time as you're reflecting back? (laughs) (laughs) Um no. No. <laughs> We've had a couple beers since then. Um but <laughs> I, I feel pretty confident, you know, that that I liked it then because I like it now. Um for the same reasons. I think it was a very it's a well balanced IPA. You know, it's not a hop bomb. Um but there's definite hop presence there. And um I think it is had a good balance with the maltiness and the hoppiness. Um, I didn't. I got a little bit of alcohol warmth right at the end from the higher ABV, and I gave it a three. Oh, a three. Reverend Mark, what do you think of Double Simcoe from Weyerbacher? Well, most of the time I'm a little skeptical about, like, all one hop sort of uh, kind of a brewing schedule. Um, but I think Simcoe may be a hop that you can you can do that with success, but at least this kind of beer, uh, uh, a high-gravity um, IPA. Uh, it's interesting. I can remember years back uh, before the Imperial IPAs really, you know, started stor- standing aside and becoming, you know, just a, like a known commodity that uh, you basically judge these kinds of beers as American barley wines. Hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I mean that's sort of where you put them before we started there, creating. Well, there wasn't a category for them; they were yeah. way too big to be IPAs, yeah. mm-hmm. and yeah. 
they really weren't barley wines because of the amount of hops that you had in them. But yeah, that would be unfair were such to high judge us as an yeah. IPA for sure. Yeah. So you know, it makes me think of like uh, old foghorn. You know, yeah, maybe. that's a really good comparison. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I and I so I think that this this particular this this uh, Weyerbacher Double Simcoe, uh, it was a good one to end up with on this uh, you know uh, litany of mostly barley wines because I like that pop at the end with uh, well you know it was it was bitter but not overly uh, it seemed to be very well attenuated for as big a beer as it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I like a malt backbone, but I don't like sweet when I'm when I'm really wanting the hop to speak to me. So no, I was I was very uh, pleased with this and give it a four easily. Wow, I'm about to whoop and see. Uh, 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 but you should really not make that sound. <clears throat> Good old boy, John. What do you think of Double Simcoe here? Well, there's no surprise here. Uh, I really really like this beer. Um, I had a friend who was traveling brought me back a bomber of this recently, and and uh, and I had this. And I really, really like it. It reminds me of uh, Pliny the Elder kind of beer where it's really hoppy. It's really big, but it's not overly bitter. It's very smooth. The alcohol sneaks up on you because you don't really realize it's a 9% beer. Um, And I honestly, if you hadn't told me it was Devil Simcoe, you wouldn't know that it's just one hop in this beer. it's It's a hop that has a lot of character and has... And it depends on the varieties from what I've been told um, with the Simcoe. Sometimes you get ones that are more piney and resiny and less grapefruity. You mean dank? And less dank. And more dank versus less dank. (laughs) There are some, there really really are. There are some crop years. What does more dank smell like? Well, John without a shower, John with a shower. I'll be quite honest. The dank character, if, if you want to get very technical and. The 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 way I've always heard Dank described is a fresh bag of weed, and <laughs> and that that's how I've heard it described. Um, this Simcoe has that character in the background with a lot of citrus over notes to kind of mellow that out. There are other there are other hops that have much more of that Dank character without all the citrus, but um, this beer really really smooth, really really nice, not overly bitter, and it's a kind of beer that. It's very, like Mark said, very attenuated, very dry finish, uh, which, and I'm I'm right on there with Mark. I do not like a sweet IPA. The East Coast versions tend mm-hmm. to be very sweet mm-hmm. and, and hoppy, bittery, and it's a mess. But I like them to be West Coast style, kind of dry, very bitter, nice, flavorful. Mm-hmm. And I get to, I get this a four plus. Wow. <clears throat> Well, uh, the Double Simcoe uh, for me, um, you know, I definitely remembered uh, what this tasted like, you know, last time, and uh, it was really great to come back and be able to taste this once again. I really liked, uh, I liked it the first time around, and uh, I had some of the same impression that Mark uh, mentioned as well, which was... Uh, I was so glad to have something to just give my palate a break from all the sweet, you know, sweet stuff that you know I mentioned kind of earlier with a lot of the other beers that we were having. It was just kind of great, and it was almost like a break from my palate going, "Oh, okay, uh, my palate's not busted." <laughs> um, I really uh, thought this was incredibly well balanced. That was the first thing that I wrote down, and uh, I enjoyed smelling it. I enjoyed tasting it. I even went back for uh, yet another uh, taste of this. Um, the only thing that's disappointing about this is that we don't have a, a mini keg or a bomber of this today. Um, that's the only problem that I would have with this. So my rating for this is a four. My body should really not make that sound as well. So I have a homework assignment for, for you guys. I want you to go back, listen to the show uh, that we did on Double Simcoe. And uh, after we post this, I want you to go, wow. I said exactly the same thing, or <laughs> wow, I said something completely different. So that'll be a interesting point of epiphany. Well, we have a few more minutes here uh, to uh, talk about some of the other beers uh, that were on our list, but were not on our top five. So uh, was there uh, anybody that uh, had like something in their uh, top five that they want to talk about? Juliana? Sorry, as I'm like waving my hand up for those who can't see me. Um, I just want to talk a minute about Verboten um, because I really, really dig it. And I, I've been sipping on this one too as it's been warming up. You know what's neat about this is that it is a Belgian style ale, you know, so you're getting your sugars, 
Um, you're getting a traditional Belgian flavor, but because it's infused with American hops like Cascade, it's a really neat mix, and it makes me now want to try brewing something like this. Um, mm. I'm just really enjoying this American twist on a traditional Belgian ale. Mm. And I'm just saying, for those of you that want something a little bit different, verboten is that. Wow. Uh, anybody else? Uh, was there something else on your list that you went, wow, um, we didn't talk about that already? I mentioned earlier I like Blasphemy was probably my second favorite hmm. of all of them, so I know I was not in league wow. with everyone else, but I liked it quite a lot. So. Huh. He likes the oats barley wine. Hmm. Um, that was a barley wine, right? Quad. Quad. Yeah. There you go. I knew I'd get it dead wrong. <laughs> I don't think so, Mike. Not today. Um, so actually, uh, my topic uh, was not something we talked about as well. Uh, so I love the Last Chance IPA. And it was uh, we opened that bottle, and that bottle just kind of was like naturally fermenting you know, like out the top, and it had like this four inch stack of of a head coming out the top of it. And uh, it was the only bottle that we had that did that. I don't know if it was just transportation was shaking it up or something. But um, I really loved that IPA. Uh, I thought it was really good. Um, it was really straightforward. Um, it was probably be an IPA that I would come back around to. Um, I've had an awful lot of the Founders um, All Day IPA uh, lately. Really great beer. Um, and it seems like it's a great session IPA and I really thought this was in that same category that it was just really great and very refreshing very well balanced it wasn't just an IPA that I just felt like was abrasive or completely over the top maybe that's like a new category I want to describe as <laughs> session IPAs where you can sit down and probably have you know more than you know two or three at a time because I really thought the, that was one one IPA that I would probably come back around to. Yeah, and oddly enough, that's a style that, that's really becoming more popular, these lower alcohol IPAs, which it's kind of an oxymoron to call anything a session IPA because an IPA is supposed to be a higher hopped or an, and higher alcohol version of an APA. And what you're basically saying is, you know, I want a really, really highly hopped American pale ale that's lower in alcohol but has way more hops so that it can really stand out on its own. And, but you can also drink more than just one of them in a, in a sitting. Uh, a lot of IPAs are getting that way to where you, you really, mm-hmm. they're all in the 7 or 8 or 9% range. And uh, I am like you, I like to be able to sit down and enjoy more than just one beer at a time. If I can. Yeah, and that, uh, for some reason, that Founders is, I don't know, for, it's just kind of been, you know, I get on a rut sometimes, and um, it seems like uh, I've had a couple of six-packs of that, and I go, where's the rest? You know, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, one one of my go-to beers uh, is what John is describing here for you know uh, a somewhat session strength IPA um, that um, fairly simple, straightforward. You get very quaffable, uh, and it's really kind of a benchmark uh, that maybe we're getting back to a little bit now is uh, the Anchor Liberty. Hmm. Um, I really like it a lot. You can't get it here. You can only get in in Tennessee. Um, yeah. I think the uh, steam. The steam. The steam yeah. 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 Uh, but I know that they don't use crystal malt hardly uh, or not at all in the grist. So it's a it's a very uh, you know pale light golden IPA. And I like that for a kind of a lower alcohol. You you don't need the caramel. You yeah. just yeah. So it's. I, just a pitch for that beer. Next time you're in Atlanta, <laughs> pick me up a six pack. Well, it was uh, really great to uh, cover these beers from Wirebacher. If you guys had to go back and uh, and cover one Wirebacher beer that we didn't talk about today, is there one that you we, you wish that they would send to us and we'd cover that one? Monk. Ah, well, monk. I, I knew that was going to be Monk. <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. One keg of Monk to sip, suds, and smokes. All right. Well, uh, I look forward to trying more beers from Weyerbacher as well. With that many beers that they make, it would be great to come back around and enjoy quite a few more. For now, I want to thank my co-host for joining us in this discussion and these 10 beers we got to go through today. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you. Good old boy, Dave. Thanks a lot. Reverend Mark. Pleased to be here. Thank you for the sermon today. And <laughs> good old boy, John. Thanks. 
Well, thank you all for listening to this uh, episode of Sip, Suds, and Smokes. Uh, this is good old boy Mike. Uh, I'm going to ask you to definitely take time and capture some of your rating about our episode or about our show in general. Uh, we probably have a contest in flight right now. If you haven't taken a look at our swag shop, you should definitely take a look at that. We can pick up lots of great beer, T-shirts, hats, and mouse pads and you know uh, beer holders and cubbies and all kinds of great stuff that we're selling through our swag shop now so that'd be really great check it out um as well as a contest this uh, episode is probably going to air before we go to gabf and uh we'll uh both uh, reverend mark and good old boy mike will be there at gabf together and uh, we'll definitely have a special gabf episode coming up before that that you can check out as well For now, I want to thank you again for joining us and ask you to keep on sipping. Tan Hand production of Sip, Suds, and Smokes, a program devoted to the appreciation of some of the finer slices of life. From the dude in the basement studios, your host, the good old boys, will see you all next time.